Osiris. Hi, this is Lucas Nelson with Promise of the Real, and the podcast you're listening to is part of the Osiris Network. Osiris is creating a community that connects people like you with podcasts and live experiences about artists and topics you love. Sign up for the newsletter at OsirisPod.com to stay in the loop. Louisville, York, out of Gopher Wood, the flooded came in, the ark it stood, and no larks are moving, and moving, and moving, and no larks are moving, and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no, and no. Now who built the ark? Oh no, and my lord, no larks are moving, and moving, and moving, and no larks are moving, and moving along. March the animals two by two, the hippopotamus and the kangaroo. And no larks are moving, and moving, and moving. No larks are moving, and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no, and no. Now who built the ark? Oh no, and my lord. No larks are moving, and moving, and moving. No larks are moving, and moving along. Noah and the devil playing seven up. The devil win the ark and Noah wouldn't give it up. But no larks are moving and moving and moving. No larks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no and no and. Who built the ark? Oh no and my lord. No larks are moving and moving and moving. No larks are moving and moving along. I know it sent a dove to find dry land. The dove came back with a big grain of sand. No larks are moving and moving and moving. No larks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no, and no. Now who built the ark? Oh no, and my lord. No larks are moving and moving and moving. No larks are moving and moving along. Had no hat, had no crown, looked like a poor man living in town. No lads are moving and moving and moving, no docks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no, and no. Now who built the ark? Oh no, and my lord. No docks are moving and moving and moving, no docks are moving and moving along. I had no buggy, had no spokes. I looked like Grandpa and all of his folks. No larks are moving and moving and moving. No larks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no, and no. Now who built the ark? Oh no, and my lord. No larks are moving and moving and moving. No larks are moving and moving along. I had no hat, had no brim, looked like a crow's nest swinging on a limb. No, no larks are moving and moving and moving, no larks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh no, and no. Now who built the ark? Oh, oh no, and my lord. No larks are moving and moving and moving, no larks are moving and moving, no moving along. Welcome to RTN Theology number eight. My name is Bob Crawford, and today I'm excited to welcome to our show Catherine O'Donnell, the faculty head and associate professor of history at Arizona State University. She recently uh, released a book entitled Elizabeth Seton, American Saint, and really excited that she's got another one in the works, The History of the Jesuits in the United States. Today, we're going to talk about Catholics in early American history. Catherine O'Donnell, welcome to RTN Theology. Thank you for having me. Well, I'd like to set the table for Elizabeth Seton. Uh, and I think, you know, on this show, we've talked to, to John Fia before, and we've talked a lot about Protestant American history. You know, the Protestants played, uh, a, many would argue that, America is a Protestant nation, mm-hmm. um, but the Catholics have been here all along. I mean, going back to the the ear- earliest uh, settling of, of the of the of North America, um, but they began to uh, take on a different role. I'd say post French Indian War. Um, can you maybe for our listeners talk about how Catholics were were uh, introduced into the United States uh, during like the settling period of the nation prior to prior to the revolution. Absolutely. Um, so Catholics enter what would become the United States through um, a, a number of different empires, right? Uh, the the French Empire, 
um, in sort of northern New England, mainly in Canada, but in, including parts of what would become the United States, the Spanish Empire, right, the Southwest, California, um, but also, and I think this is what most surprises people, um, in parts of the 13 colonies. And where they mainly met, went was Maryland, which was founded in great measure as a kind of uh, refuge for for Catholics, um, uh, the, the Calverts, who were a convert family, uh, chartered the colony. So there are Catholics in Maryland from the very beginning. Uh, they lose control of the colony fairly early on politically, but they're always socially and economically powerful there. And in fact, um, p- part of that tradition was a fairly uh, tolerant, pluralist approach to religions, uh, because Catholics in that context understood that they were not going to successfully be a state religion, and so worked to create a colony in which uh, a variety of forms of Christianity, right, not all religions, uh, but forms of Christianity could find a home. So they they are there from the beginning, um, and uh, they actually participate in great numbers in the revolution. If you if you want to move ahead to the American Revolution, uh, Catholics in Maryland, and by that point they'd moved into Pennsylvania, parts of what would become Kentucky and so forth, tended to favor the cause of independence. Was there a, a hostility uh, towards Catholics? I know in New England in particular, yeah. um, the Pope's Day, November 5th, yeah. uh, Ga- the anniversary of Guy Fawkes, what they would call Guy Fawkes Day. Uh, maybe uh, talk. A- so in New England, you know, we think of the pilgrims. We think of John Winthrop. We, you know, we think of the Massachusetts Bay uh, Colony Congregationalists. This really right. Puritan uh, uh part of the country, they didn't like the Catholics, right? Right, no. I mean, Catholics were uh, everything that the British uh, did not want to be, did not really want to have in their territory. It was this sort of remarkable antithesis um, of everything British, and that, that transferred to to the colonists, to most of the colonists who were, as you absolutely correctly point out, um, overwhelmingly Protestant. So Catholics were thought to um, lack the kind of independence of mind um, that uh, British uh, people considered an element of, of Britishness. Um, they were thought to follow their priests or their pope, and that not only made them not kind of good individuals in this view, but it also made them unpatriotic because the argument went that their first loyalty was always to um, this guy <laughs> in Rome, uh, not not to whomever their their leader was. And so this is a kind of political argument. It's a spiritual argument that Catholics did not have an individual relationship to God, but only an individual through clergy, and it's also very much a geopolitical argument, so that Catholics were thought to be this kind of potential fifth column that who would align with the French or the Spanish, or really anyone who came by <laughs> who, was, who was seeking to harm British interests. And, and, and it didn't help in that part of the, of, of the country because you had Canada was French-Canadian, and it, yeah. was, it was not far away I mean, it was only hours away from Massachusetts, so it was not. Yeah, yeah. it was not far away, and it came closer uh, in raids. Right? I mean, this is this is not simply kind of an imagined threat. There, there, there actually were French alliances with indigenous peoples um, in wartime, and sometimes there were uh, there were raids on uh, New England colonies. So. So there, there was a real component to what was also kind of a, a set of cultural attitudes. I would have to uh, recommend to our listeners John Demos, The Unredeemed yes. Captive, if you yes. want to get an idea of the tension between Catholics and Protestants and this time in American history. Uh, uh, that, that is a great historical narrative to go to. So let me ask you about Pope's Day. I, I love telling my friends about Pope's Day. Because, you know, me and my son, we go out and we play, uh, we shoot basketball, we play horse, right? Or, or, uh, or, Uh or we try to play go fish, me and my kids and my wife. 
But on Pope's Day in New England, the kids played a game called Break the Pope's Neck. So, right. <laughs> so right. maybe j- j- just as a way to uh, emphasize this host- this Protestant Catholic hostility, maybe tell our listeners a little bit about the what would happen in Boston on November fifth before the American Revolution in the years uh, yeah, prior. I- yeah. Absolutely. And so the, you know, the reference was to this effort to blow up the British Parliament, which had failed and was connected to um, uh, what the British felt very strongly was a, a, a broad Catholic conspiracy. So, so Pope's Day is the annual ce- celebration of that failure and of the fact that the British were not Catholic. Um, and in addition to these children's games, you know, adults would um, make effigies of the Pope, kind of Pope puppets. Um, and march them through the streets, burn them publicly. Um, there would be all kinds of toasts, uh, some of them rude. And, you know, after you do enough toasts, everything is rude, right? Um, <laughs> again, kind of uh, attacking the papacy and attacking Catholics. And this this went forward um, through the revolutionary period. George Washington, as I recall, actually was uneasy about these celebrations during the revolution, right? Because when you're fighting a war, you do not want denominational divisions uh, among your troops. And Washington, in, in general, made a point throughout his kind of career, um, also as a statesman, of reaching out to the Catholic communities. Uh, but this was this was absolutely part of the fabric of of British life and of life of life in the colonies. If you were British, you were not Catholic. You did um, make fun of the Pope, burn the Pope in effigy. Um, uh, and and that was that was just absolutely unquestioned. Uh, uh, a guy named uh, is it Brennan McConnell? Brendan McConville, Bre- absolutely. Brendan McConnell, uh, a book called "The King's Three Faces," and he he yeah. he makes the arg- argument, if I recall, that in the run up to the revolution, uh, the people, in particularly in New England, tried to begin to associate King George with the Pope. Yes, ab- absolutely. Um, yeah, when ki- when King George so, George was not, he was not a Catholic. No, he was not a Catholic. So, so that kind of weird um, uh, connection comes from the idea that any kind of centralized, utterly illegitimate authority was in the end Catholic, right? So, so as as colonists began to understand uh, the British monarchy as something separate from them, something that they believed uh, made independent thought and kind of dignified manhood impossible, then it's going to get kind of hotwired to their vision of the papacy because that's the role the papacy played. And so when they when New Yorkers pull down this gilded statue of George III that they had really just erected like 20 years earlier, um, there there is a great sense that they're they're attacking George III, but they're also attacking attacking what would be called like a crypto pope or a hidden pope. It's pretty wild, um, but that you know that's how cultural insults work often, right? Through these analogies that follow the logic of the culture, even if a couple of hundred years later you have to work pretty hard to see what that was. And we see it in our present day and in in, in our in our current politics. I think in some ways. Um, mm-hmm. So getting back to George Washington, uh, November fifth, seventeen seventy five. He's I guess just recently taken taken over as the general of the Continental Army. And he puts out um, a, a statement for for all the troops saying, "Hey, Guy Fawkes Day, we're not going to tolerate any anti popery, none of those games, none of the drinking, none of the carrying on. We need the French on our side." So, so is this does this begin the turn, if you will, through the revolution of maybe courting the French rather than yeah. uh, and 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 downplaying animosity towards Catholics? Yeah, I think that that is a a wonderful um, uh, moment to bring out, and it absolutely is part of this pivot um, in which uh, leaders are saying, um, 
you know who we're fighting here? <laughs> we're fighting the British Protestant monarch. And it is possible, and then later in the war, it was the fact that the French Catholic monarch is going to help. And in addition to that French support, um, there were there were Catholics within the colonies who were enlisting, uh, serving in the militia and in the Continental Army. There was a Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence, Charles Carroll, who was of course a Marylander, right? Part of this part of this Maryland tradition, um, and it gives an opening then for Catholics themselves to argue in this period and directly afterward that Catholicism is a form of Christianity, which was not something readily accepted at the time, and that as a form of Christianity, it's not an enemy to the Republic, but part of what will make the Republic succeed. So the Continental Congress says, we need to get Canada on our side. They're also being oppressed by the British, and they're Catholic, and they can't practice their faith in Canada. So they they try to send a contingent of uh, Continental Congressmen. Uh, Charles Carroll of, of Carrollton was one of them. Benjamin Franklin was one of them. I believe uh, John Carroll, who was Charles Carroll's exactly. cousin and, and a Jesuit. Uh, yeah, was also a, a part of a, a part of this little committee that went to the French Canadians and said, hey, you know, Come on, join our side. But the French Canadians, they have they have good memories, right? <laughs> yes. So this is uh, right. This is a, a kind of brainwave <laughs> of the Congress, and uh, they enlist John Carroll, who would become the first bishop and then the far- first ar- archbishop of the United States, but who at that moment is a member of the Jesuit order, which had just been suppressed, right? Because uh, Catholic history is as complicated as any sort of imperial history. They send them to Canada, and um, the argument does not fly because French Canadians know exactly what you and I were just discussing, which is that American colonists um, had, if anything, increased their kind of rhetorical animosity toward Catholics as the imperial crisis occurred. And they also know that after the British were successful in the French and Indian War, the British uh, government had extended uh, toleration to Catholicism in what had been French Canada and what was now British Canada. And the, the British argument for doing that then was exactly the argument Um, for people such as George Washington, including Catholics, right, which is that in order for this political project to work, this big, messy colony of Canada, we need people to be included rather than excluded. So the French Canadians, in short, felt more comfortable under the British government than they did under the potential government of these people who hated the Pope and were still, you know, were still as overtly hostile as ever. So what is the a- the attitude culturally in the colonies post Saratoga when the French get on board when the French c- come on on our side? Yeah. Um the way I would describe it is anti-Catholicism or anti Popery, to, to use the, the the word of the time. I once had a student say, "What did they have against popery?" Uh, but it's <laughs> popery. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that doesn't go away. Uh, it remains kind of a tool in the toolkit, um, but it receives an importance. And uh, the hostility toward uh, the British government, the gratitude toward people such as Lafayette, right, and um, the sense of inclusion of Catholics fighting in the armies, that becomes more important. It becomes more important culturally, and you also see kind of restrictions on Catholics fading out of um, state constitutions, for example, that are that are written during this period. Um, uh, the Pope's Day becomes something that is much less celebrated, and in fact, in a kind of odd coincidence, um, uh, uh, churches as the first sort of official Catholic church in Manhattan is dedicated right around Pope's Day, and nobody gives them a hard time. This is fairly shortly after the Revolution. But 
those those cultural associations, those memories remain. And so when in the 1830s and 40s you have a great surge of Catholic migration to the United States, um, you have an increased sense of threat demographically, economically, politically. Those that kind of ugliness, that kind of anti-Catholic sentiment and rhetoric is going to come back out of the toolbox, and it's going to become an important part of American history again. It seems like when in times of stress, be it financial stress or uh, uh, cultural change. Um, uh, societies tend to go back to their old boogeymen and the Catholics play that role again and again in American history. So Washington developed an affinity for these Catholics, like men like John Carroll and Charles Carroll. And the French weren't the only Catholic nation that were supporting us, although they're the most, they were the most out front about it. The Spanish were also uh, trying to help us out in certain ways. There was a Spaniard who who wasn't an official liaison or, or, or um, a diplomat for the Spanish government, Don Juan Morales. Yeah. You familiar with him? Um, you know, I don't have any research uh, about okay. him, but he is absolutely part of it. Um, there's also, um, uh, uh, I think his name is Don Juan Stoughton, who is kind of a mixed Spanish and Irish descent, who's a merchant, who's who's important in New York. So there's there's absolutely kind of a set of diplomats, merchants who are Catholic, who favor the cause of independence, and who also are just kind of economically useful to elites. And, and um, you know, the, the expression everyone's money is green can be overused, um, but there there is certainly a sense in which it is often simply practical um, to cooperate economically as well as politically, diplomatically across cultural lines, across denominational lines, and you definitely see that. Well, the one thing that the the one point that I like to make with about Don Juan Morales is that he became very close. He and Washington had a strong affinity for one another. It appears from what I've read, and that when he passed, uh, they there was a requiem mass at a Catholic church in philadelphia and members of continental of the members of the continental congress stepped foot in a catholic church and took part in a mass to honor this man and and at the time five years before it would be unheard of absolutely and this is a i think this is something that washington is not always given credit for washington also very assertively um, connected to uh, the Jewish communities in the United States, to Catholic communities in the United States, and absolutely had a, a kind of uh, pluralist, inclusive approach that was extraordinarily useful to his ability to draw together an American nation when when really we were making this up as we went along, right? There, there wasn't such a thing. And, and, and he did draw the lines far more inclusively than I think a lot of leaders at the time would have. Okay, so now I think we've set the table. It's post-revolution, and tell us, introduce Elizabeth Seton into our story. Great. So um, Elizabeth, as I think of her, uh, is actually born in New York in 1774, just as the uh, American Revolution is starting. She's born into a loyalist family, actually. Um, Her mother dies during the war. Her father remarries a woman who was very young and who never quite managed to mother her stepdaughters, which were Elizabeth and Elizabeth's sister. So um, Elizabeth grows up in a kind of a cosmopolitan milieu. So her her father is nominally an Episcopalian, had been an Anglican, now an Episcopalian, but really not very interested in church, far more interested in science and medicine. And Elizabeth grows up in, in that world. Um, she marries. Uh, she eventually has five children. And to kind of cut to the chase, uh, her husband first goes bankrupt, and then dies of tuberculosis, leaving Elizabeth an impoverished 
widow with five children. She's become interested in institutional Christianity during this period of kind of suffering. Um, But her husband dies in Italy. She's with him. They'd gone on this desperate trip to try to save his health and his business. And she becomes deeply moved by what she sees of Catholicism there. She finds it kind of sustaining in a way she had not found Episcopalianism. And she converts. So so, uh, a couple things. You talk about her her being uh, having this cosmopolitan upbringing in in New York City post American Revolution she lived off of she lived on Wall Street for a short period of time and she had some uh, famous neighbors yeah she uh, she lived on Wall Street which was then much more residential and she had Alexander Hamilton down one end she had Aaron Burr up the other end um, and her husband was a very well connected um, merchant. Um, in fact, her uh, her husband and her father-in-law worked fairly closely with Alexander Hamilton during one of the new nation's uh, first, uh, but alas, not last, uh, financial panics. Um, so she was a bit of a high flyer uh, socially, um, and uh, quite quite charming. She was uh, she was known as a beauty, um, and it, that kind of comes out in portraits, even though they're very formal. Um, and yeah, she, uh, she knew a lot of the, uh, people whose names have come down to us, who kind of shaped New York and, and shaped the country. And she enjoyed them. She was a, a witty conversationalist as well. And, and it's not that she just suddenly had a conversion. She was on a spiritual journey her whole life. Yeah. I love that you put it that way. From from her, and we have a ton. Like it's an historian's dream um, because she left letters and journals, and people left letters about her. And these wonderful sisters of charity who are part of the religious community Elizabeth founded have carefully preserved these across centuries. So yes, so it looks like from her earliest days, Elizabeth, uh, kind of on her own, because as I said, this is not coming from her family, wanted to to feel the presence of God, wanted to have a sense of that immediacy. And she also loved to read philosophy. She loved Rousseau. She called him Dear JJ <laughs> for Jean-Jacques. Um, and for for much of her, for all of her childhood, adolescence, and into her young womanhood, kind of what we might call her spirituality or her, this hunger for God's presence existed separately from her intellectual pursuits and to an extent from her from her social world as well it it was almost it was not quite spiritual but not religious right this term that we use now but but it was a little bit of that she was a little bit of a of a loner and then the the first kind of institutional home christian home that she found was in the episcopalian church and she loved that she had a close relationship with a minister um but was that Hope, found, Hobart? It was John Henry Hobart, who was a little bit controversial at the time. He was young, and this this would not shock any of your modern listeners, but he preached without notes <laughs> and in a kind of impassioned way and in this sort of genteel, uh, um, uh, quiet world of New York's Episcopalians. He was, he was a bit much, um, uh, but Elizabeth Seaton loved him. Uh, because he he kind of offered something of this presence, right, that she had wanted. Um, and also his version of Episcopalianism was pretty liturgically rich. Um, but it was not as rich as what she found in Italy among Catholics. And she was perfectly ex- aware. She'd been exposed to the kind of casual anti-Catholicism that still persisted, right, during the revolution and after that, we, that we've that we talked about. So she did not expect to have anything other than like a tourist's reaction to what she was seeing, almost a kind of eat, pray, love, <laughs> sort of look at these lovely people doing these things that I respect but would not do. But then she just kind of almost against her will finds herself moved when she's in a mass as a tourist. It occurs to her, I'm not really here as a tourist at this moment. I am moved as a spiritual seeker by what is going on around me and this this desire for presence, right, Um, that she'd always felt is fulfilled in Italian Catholic churches in a way that it never had been in the churches or the individual seeking of her youth. 
And she she goes to Italy because her husband is seeking a cure, seeking to be healed, correct? He's sick. He has tuberculosis. Yes, he has tuberculosis, and his business is dying as well. And she writes um, that she knows their friends think that they're crazy. This is not going to work. And in fact, as soon as they get to Italy, they are quarantined. Uh, No one understands that tuberculosis is contagious, but the Italians have an inkling. (laughs) And, And this is good for medical science, but it's terrible for the Seton family. Because she, her husband, and their little eight-year-old daughter are quarantined in what I is basically a lighthouse. It's like a an uninsulated um, brick and stone building, literally out in the water. Um, and they're kept there for a month, and his uh, tubercular suffering just becomes more and more intense. It's excruciating to read her journal from from this period. Um, and they're finally let out after about a month, and he's dead within a week after that. So she's left in Italy in the in the care of a, a family who are Catholic, uh, deeply Catholic, and who are merchant kind of associates of her late husband. She's there with her daughter. She expects that she'll be polite and she'll leave, and then Italy will just be the story she tells, right? Once upon a time, I was in Italy. Um, and instead, because of her reaction to Catholicism, it becomes this um, pivot point in her in her life, but also really in the history of Catholicism in the United States because she's such an influential figure. So she comes back, and she's Catholic, and she, she comes back to, to everyone mourning the loss of her husband. Uh, his business is now gone uh, what is what is the rea- reaction of her uh, conversion to those around her, to those who knew her? Oh, my goodness. They are startled and um, in some cases angry. Now, these uh, the, her circle are are merchants, and many of them had dealings with with Catholic merchants in the way I mentioned. But they still understand Catholicism as, at best, the religion of the past, right? A religion of superstition when people didn't know it, didn't know any better. It's not a religion you convert to. It's a religion you grow, grow out of, right? That's their view. And they also feel, because Elizabeth comes back bringing one of this family with her, um, Antonio Felici, who's this uh, merchant. He's married, but he's very dashing and handsome and charming. Yeah, and she she um, falls in love. She, what what happened between between them on the way back from Italy? Yeah, this is a this is the kind of unexpected and 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 very human story. So Elizabeth, um, all her life had strong relationships with men. She had a very good relationship with her father. She she adored her husband. She had male friends. Um, and I think after her husband's death, she it doesn't strike her as unusual at all that she would have a friendship with these merchant brothers. One is Filippo and one is Antonio. And her friendship with Filippo remains in a kind of, um, you know, acceptable, non-threatening um, format. But Ant- Antonio becomes to her... Um, the source of happiness and comfort, and uh, in a way that unsettles her profoundly. And she cuts off communication with him, even when she's in Italy, because she is worried that she is falling in love with him. And I think that that was possible because it seemed impossible, right? I mean, she was deeply mourning her husband, whom she had loved. And I think it it was impossible to her that she would fall for someone else until she realized she had. She was excited when she saw him. She found herself thinking about him. So she cuts off that relationship. But then she decides that that Antonio is not a romantic attachment, but is instead her connection to Catholicism. And the excitement she feels when she sees Antonio is her excitement about this new faith. But then on the ship home, he's sent back with her as a kind of chaperone. And because the Feliki, this family, know perfectly well when she gets off this ship, people are going to try to talk her out of being Catholic. 
so Antonio is sent back with her, and then something else happens on the ship, and it's and it's not clear what. And it I'm sure it was extremely mild because Elizabeth uh, uh, was absolutely kind of in command of her of herself, but it is enough to horrify her. Whether it was uh, even holding hands, whatever it was, it was enough to horrify her. So she again rededicates herself to making sure this friendship is chaste. It is chaste. I've got no doubt about that. It is also romantic. You cannot read these letters, including letters she wrote to him after their arrival in New York, and not feel that kind of her desire to find a new home, to make sure this faith is her true faith, is all caught up in her love for for Antonio. So it's just, I mean, it's just... It's complicated in a really human way, right? It's, it's hard to categorize, but it was intense. So, and and of course, you know, people pick up on this. They they don't s- suspect an affair, and and again, there's no physical affair here. But but they see they see the romance of it. They just see that this Italian has come back with their beloved Elizabeth, and her husband is dead, and now she's a Catholic. Um, and so they 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 can try to convince her that she's just been sort of you know, hornswoggled uh, by these people. And when she gets over her grief and Antonio backs away, um, she will uh, she will again become a good Protestant. And in fact, Antonio backs away immediately. Uh, he, he is married. He does not want trouble. He sees that he is, if anything, harming the prospects of Elizabeth converting. So he actually hightails it to Boston as, as soon as he can. And then Elizabeth is left with this months and months of kind of agonizing over whether her family and minister are right and she should become a Protestant again or whether her own kind of internal spiritual inclination is right and she should really be Catholic. What is Hobart's reaction? Hobart is heartbroken and betrayed. So Hobart... Um, again, had been this kind of slightly, well, more than slightly controversial figure um, in Trinity Parish, which is still this right gorgeous Episcopalian church um, in the, the the very downtown part of, of of Manhattan near what was the World Trade Center. So for Hobart, Elizabeth Seton had become a kind of spiritual collaborator in a very sincere way, in a somewhat more strategic way. Um, She was also a a legitimation of his efforts, right? She was this respected matron who absolutely believed in his ministership. And to add the final wrinkle to it, I mentioned that Hobart's Episcopalianism was liturgically rich and respected the clergy. Well, a criticism that some fellow Episcopalians launched against him was that his Episcopalianism was too close to Catholicism. Well, my goodness, now his like, primary follower actually becomes a Catholic. So the whole thing could not have been worse, as he saw it. And he wrote a very long, I mean, treatise, right? It's handwritten. He's got stuff crossed out. It just feels like something someone wrote passionately, almost desperately, explaining to her that Catholicism was barbaric, it was superstitious, it was grotesque, right? He sees transubstantiation, the idea that God is present in the Eucharist, as gross. Who believes that anymore, right? This is Hobart's view. Um, And he just expends all kind of energy trying to uh, get her back into the the fold of Episcopalianism, And, and of course he fails. So how does she begin to define herself as a Catholic? How does she begin? How does she become Mother Seton? Yeah. Um, so she, after a long period of agonizing and um, realizing kind of within herself that the way Catholicism offered then a kind of material culture, it offered the culture of the saints, even gestures like the sign of the cross, which she had been unfamiliar with. Catholicism, um, to her, brings heaven to earth in a way that the Protestantism that she knew had not. So that is an immense part of the appeal. But she admits that another part of the appeal is that Catholic claims that they were the only safe path to salvation are actually just made more ferociously 
them Protestant claims. And so it's a, sort of a variant of Pascal's wager. She kind of thinks, well, um, if I can't be sure, I will just believe the Catholics because they seem more sure than anybody else um, that this is the way to go. Um, so, so she kind of, um, at that moment, after a lifetime believing in reason, um, a abandons reason or says reason has taken me this far faith will have to take me the rest of the way and my faith is going to be in the church so she becomes catholic um but she becomes and she's orthodox but throughout the rest of her life she seeks out priests who are kindred right she does not she never simply accepts whatever priest is in the vicinity she is entirely uninterested in the papacy. Now, it's a tough period for the papacy, right? Because uh, uh, one pope after another, quite literally, is taken captive, and uh, uh, communication in general is difficult. But her her Catholicism is very much centered on, um, even on scripture, right? It emerges out of her Protestant upbringing, individual response to scripture, right? She doesn't give that up um, when she becomes a Catholic. She finds priests quite assertively who she finds to be good spiritual collaborators, and she continues to take great delight in the culture of the saints, in religious pictures and objects, um, in feast days, right, in, in these kind of human cultural offerings that Catholicism made. And she is delighted when priests help her to create a religious community in which she can act as a as a as a what we call a woman religious so like it's kind of like a nun but not cloistered right it's not technically a nun although outsiders would call them nuns um she takes a vow of poverty chastity obedience um but she is able to have her five children near her even within this religious community so she's able to to become Mother Seton, as you said, capital M Mother, right, this this leader of religious community, but she also remains little M Mother. She's able to continue um, mothering her own children at the same time. W- would you consider her a mystic? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, she I think she is much more of a mystic than um, she's given credit for, because historians have a tendency to put people in buckets. And there's a bucket for um, pious women. And in that bucket is the idea of benevolence work, right? That pious um, women in the United States are, are outward directed. Seton absolutely founded a community that was outward directed, that did enormous amounts of benevolence work and continues to. But um, left to her own devices, she was a contemplative um, and she uh, increasingly um, sort of immersed herself in Christ's suffering, in the idea of the brokenness of all creation in um, the kind of sorrow and beauty of accepting humanity's sinfulness and through that acceptance um, uh, having this kind of boundless gratitude toward God, which then could circle back and enable her to have a boundless love for the other sinful creatures. But her activism, her kind of social work, really had to work through that contemplative, um, mystical pathway in in order to be um, to be energized. This time period, this I'd say eighteen hundred to eighteen twenty, it's all a rise in in the Protestant world of women becoming active in social reform as well, correct? Absolutely, yes, absolutely correct. So that this is kind of a part of the Second Great Awakening, and people sort of flinch, historians flinch when I say that, because the Second Great Awakening is about Protestantism, and it is um, in the main, right? But Elizabeth Seton and some of the women who joined her, some of whom were converts, right, are also looking for a more intense form of Christianity, 
in the way that other participants in the Second Great Awakening who tended to invent or find new forms of Protestantism were as well. Um, and the, the other thing that she kind of benefits from is that after the cosmopolitan sort of philosophically inquiring period of the revolution ended, um, there began to be more suspicion of, say, deism, right, or the idea of kind of a distant God who doesn't intervene in human affairs, and more suspicion of what we might now call secularism than of um, Catholicism even. So that Seton, as a matron, right, as a mother, as someone who doesn't look like one of those scary nuns who people found so alienating, could be this wonderfully um, respectable face for for Catholicism in a country that, as we talked about, still had this kind of cultural mistrust of that religion. In the academic interest of always asking or seeking to ask and discover and stimulate new questions, is there a line to be investigated that says there was a Catholic branch off of the Second Great Awakening? I would love to see that. Yes, absolutely. Um, You know, I did Catholic practices change, and you see priests writing to each other that my goodness you know we're having a they're having a revival near near us we must respond right and um uh one of uh a priest whom elizabeth worked closely with and who could never quite master english she was french um would have her help him write his sermons and he knew perfectly well that he needed to as he thought of it attract people to the communion rail right which is absolutely kind of of a piece with the second great great awakenings revivalism and you see you see converts to catholicism who are who are making this choice so yes i would love to see uh professors and graduate students uh (laughs) exploring that avenue excellent so a question we always ask um and i could go on on this line of questioning for six hours, but I'm not going to keep you all day and I'd love to have you back on. And maybe we can talk about Catholics moving into the antebellum period at some point, if you're interested. Great. I'd love to. And of course, we'd love to hear about the history of the Jesuits. Um, But the road to now, our, our mission statement is that the individual's narrative is influenced by and tied up with and influences the historical narrative. And so Mm -hmm. how did you become interested in this, uh, this discipline of study? Oh, what a wonderful question. Um, so I, uh, was brought up Catholic, um, was always fascinated, um, by saints. Um, Although I had more of a taste for the medieval ones who, you know, smelled like roses after they died, right? The the sort of classically amazing, miraculous saints. And Elizabeth Seton was more of a background figure. Um, When I started my academic career, my um, academic life was entirely separate um, from that kind of spiritual questioning or tradition that I had come out of. Um, And I wrote very happily about literature. Um, After I was finishing that, when I was finishing that project, I was teaching a small class. I was doing a postdoc at William & Mary, and I was teaching it through biography. And a young woman said, I want to write about Mother Seton. And um, I thought, well, there must be a thousand um, uh, biographies of Mother Seton. And I was interested to know, to find out that there were not. And as I looked more into this, I realized that I, that her, her sainthood had kind of repelled scholarly inquiry in a way, um, that she wasn't understood as a woman. She certainly wasn't understood as a career woman, as someone who had founded this important institution. Um, and when she did turn up in historical narratives, it was purely as a kind of a benevolence worker. It wasn't disrespectful, but it was it was very kind of separate. So I thought I'd do, you know, as one does, I'll write an article about this <laughs> in six months. You know, 10 years later, I finished the book. Um, but as I as I worked my way through it, I found immense. I, don't, I mean, I would almost use the word solace in, in, in participating in her lifetime of inquiry and 
and and seeing her ask the questions that she asks and seeing her wrestle even with things like pluralism, right? Like how was she supposed to make her very single, what became a single-minded faith? How was she supposed to live in harmony with others who didn't share that faith? Um, And as I worked in these archives, I also was exposed to the women who ran these archives who tended to either be sisters of charity or have connections to to that world and just was so personally moved and humbled and enriched by their understanding of Elizabeth Seton, by their life and community, and by their absolute confidence in saying, Catherine, you research everything. There are no boundaries um, because Elizabeth Seton was a wonderful woman and a force of good in the world. And there is nothing you can do as a scholar that will, that will threaten our understanding of that. And they were absolutely right. So it remains an academic project, but it also became this deeply kind of, again, I just come back to the word humbling, (laughs) humbling and fulfilling um, path to walk um, with people from the past through the, through the documents and also with these wonderful kind of women uh, of of now, right? To use your 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 podcast phrasing, who who are still um, living in community with her and still asking these questions and coming up with these extraordinarily generous, spiritually rich answers. There are some great r- historians of American religion and historians of the church in the United States uh, right now, um, mm-hmm. but some of them aren't religious. They're not, they're not, they're history, they're historians of, of Christ, Christianity in America, but they're not Christians. Do you mm-hmm. think it, it, it adds or, you know, I'm, I'm taking historical methods right now, right? So, Absolutely. so I have learned that bias, uh, is, is in, cho- in selecting your topic. There's bias in selecting mm-hmm. your topic. Do you think it adds to a religious historical work for, the the uh the academic to be to share in that faith or do you think that someone who who doesn't share in the faith can be more objective about it more yeah. detached uh, I, uh, 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 anyone can study anything right this i uh, this is my view and um the 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 past is a foreign country right my kind of starting point is that any person of of the present is so distant from people of the past, even when we might feel we have gender connections, ethnic connections, denominational connections. So I feel strongly about that. I also feel that faith is something that can be overlooked very easily, even when it was central to the people that were studying. And, and it, it's, it's hard to see, it's hard to describe, um, and it, it can be awkward to write about um, when you're coming out of a social science tradition. But it is utterly un, unfaithful, maybe that's not the best word, but it's utterly unfaithful to the past not to take faith seriously, right? Not to see it as a force in an individual life, as a force in the world like hunger, right? Like the quest for power, right? Like, like all these other things that we acknowledge. Um, and it, and it may be that, um, that it is easier for, for some people to take faith, uh, more seriously than others, you know, but, but it, it, it has to be, um, it, it should be studied seriously, um, as a force in the world, um, in a way that it often isn't. And I, I would want everyone, everyone to do that. And I guess I'm kind of agnostic <laughs> on the, on the question of, of who is, who is best going to succeed. You, you know, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that there was this period of deism, uh, during the revolution, mm-hmm. uh, which we can associate with the Enlightenment, I guess, and then there was the the Second Great Awakening, and there was this like period of like r- a fever of religion swept the country, if you will. And then, if we look at like again, right now, I'm I'm viewing everything through historical methodologies. So you have mm-hmm. um, these social theories like 
um, Marxism and gender theories. And then you have uh, the rise of cultural theories that, again, look at, take religion seriously, where Marxism or gender theories don't Mm -hmm. so much look at at religion um, and then cultural theories do kind of the religion is worth investigating. Now we're, are we in this postmodern period? Uh, and, and where does religion fit into historical inquiry? Yeah. Um, it is, it, it is, it, sh- it should be everywhere in a, in a sense. I mean, in a, maybe in a way analogous to, to gender, right? So that one of the things that gender scholars taught us was that even works that are not pitching themselves as explicitly about gender must understand that women play a role, must understand that gendered language plays a role, right? Um, and I, I think it would be valuable if we are approaching um, a moment in which, for example, someone studying labor unions in the 20th century would, would just think it necessary to ask, how did the social gospel movement intersect with labor movements? How did Jesuits, mm-hmm. right, like my, how did Jesuits who ran labor schools uh, intersect with that, even if their primary focus were, were not religion? And, and I would say even more assertively, I, 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 I would hope that the idea that religion is simply a cover for something that's real, right? That um, that religion is superstructural, or that if someone says they're doing for something for religious purposes, really underneath that is an actual motive. I would I would hope that that kind of analysis um, is is largely discredited, or you would have to prove it, right? The assumption couldn't be that the religious motive was insincere. You would need to offer evidence that the religious motive was insin- was insincere, as you would need to offer evidence that any other motive was insincere. So, so I guess I see it as, as, as something that would be valuable in every study and as well as something that can be the center of, you know, a certain number of, of scholarly works. And I try to convince my colleagues of that with varying varying degrees of success. Well, we covered so much in this interview and I feel like we left out so much more. So we need to do it again. Uh, the book is Elizabeth Seton, American Saint. You can pick it up wherever fine books are sold. Uh, and also you can download it from Libro.fm. Do you know what Libro.fm is? I do not. Libro.fm is one of the sponsors of our of our program. But more importantly, they are um, similar to the other major a site where you would download an, an audio book. But Great. if you join Libro.fm and you purchase American Saint, they will ask you what independent bookstore you want to send a portion of your payment to. So you sign that up. That is amazing. You get a membership to Libro. You sign up your local bookstore that you love and you want to support. And every time you get a book on Libro, you uh, some uh, some of those proceeds go to your favorite local bookstore. That is wonderful. We have this bookstore changing hands in Tempe. That's that's brilliant. So I will do this. You need to do it. And that is where I downloaded uh, your book. And so it is there. And uh, so excited. Great. Um, and Great. I hope everyone. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to get you to tell us everything about Mother Seton because I want our listeners to go buy the book and read it for themselves. But thank you so much, Catherine O'Donnell. Oh, this was such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you do for the least of these, so you have done for me. Come-